Welcome and thank you for joining me for today's program, Lesser Known First Ladies Making the Most of One Term. When you think of the 43 different men who have occupied the office of president, beginning with George Washington in 1789, to Barack Obama and all those to follow, what words come to mind? When you think of the many different women who have served as first ladies, beginning with Martha Washington in 1789, to Michelle Obama and all those yet to follow, what words come to mind? How about important, interesting, intriguing, influential, inspiring, we might say the eyes have it. I invite you to step back in time with me, but keep an eye to the future. After all, another presidential election is looming large. This is a good time to learn something new about somebody lesser known. We begin with Louisa Catherine Adams, cultured and dignified, wife of John Quincy Adams, stubborn and humorless, the last of the aristocrats, the end of the Founding Fathers era. The date is July 26th, 1797, the day that Louisa Catherine Johnson, daughter of a wealthy American merchant and his British wife, and John Quincy Adams get married in London, England. Louisa is educated in Paris. She speaks fluent French, the language of diplomats. Her family takes refuge in France during the American Revolution. She knows the classics, Latin and Greek. She plays the harp and the piano. Little does Louisa know that her exposure to exquisite French cuisine and refined social graces befitting a lady will stand her in good stead many years later as the first lady of the United States of America. Louisa has an inquisitive mind. She's a lifelong learner. She is well read. She especially enjoys reading biographies and memoirs of women who are associated with men of fame and power. John Quincy is distinguished the eminent son of the American Vice President, a well-regarded diplomat in his own right. Louisa has a cultured personality and temperament. Louisa is seven years younger than John. She is most easy on the eyes, beautiful, elegantly dressed, charming, gracious, a lively conversationalist. John Quincy and Louisa's courtship is mostly by correspondence. Louisa is given ample evidence that John Quincy's nature is quite the opposite of hers. A topsy-turvy courtship or not, the marriage takes place. John Quincy is 30, Louisa is 22. In theory, it seems the marriage union should work easily. In reality, the marriage is strained from day one. You see, news comes from Louisa's father on their wedding day. Louisa's father is bankrupt. John Quincy receives no dowry. Across the Atlantic Ocean, still in 1797, George Washington is preparing to leave the presidency, and John Adams, Louisa's father-in-law, becomes the second president of the United States. John Quincy and Louisa set sail for Hamburg, Germany. Just three months into their marriage, Louisa announces, I am pregnant. Sadly, Louisa suffers a miscarriage, not once, but twice in succession over the next six months. Louisa is pregnant 14 times during her marriage. Only three children live to maturity. Her health is greatly compromised. She carries on with dignity. 
In 1801, at the age of 26, Louisa comes to the United States for the first time. This foreign-born daughter-in-law of the president brings along her three-month-old son, George Washington Adams. Louisa's first encounter with her American in-laws, especially John's mother, Abigail Adams, is less than favorable. Louisa writes, Had I stepped into Noah's Ark, I do not think I could have been more utterly astonished. John Quincy does next to nothing to boost her confidence, an early warning sign of his lifelong insensitivity toward Louisa. You see, the duty of politics is at the center of John Quincy's universe. He accepts diplomatic assignments, and Louisa follows. Louisa goes from Prussia to Massachusetts, where John Quincy resumes his much disliked law practice. She moves from Washington, D.C., where John Quincy serves an appointment to the United States Senate, then on to St. Petersburg, Russia, where John Quincy serves in diplomatic duties to the court of the Tsars. Louisa makes two trips across the big pond during those early years, back and forth, back and forth. But her biggest adventure is yet to come. Louisa's life while in St. Petersburg seems unbearable. She bears and buries her last child, infant daughter, Louisa Catherine. She leaves behind her two older sons in Massachusetts with her in-laws. It's an agonizing decision for her to make. She suffers from depression. Louisa homeschools her son Charles, and the stimulation eases her pain. But John Quincy is dismissive of her teaching efforts. He gives her a book on the diseases of the mind. What is he thinking? It appears he is not. John Quincy remains unattentive and detached. He doesn't include Louisa in any discussions or decisions about much of anything, certainly not his work. But life is not all drab and dreary for Louisa. Some historians report that Louisa's charming demeanor and beauty make her a favorite dance partner at the balls in the court of the Tsars. Then, courage and control come to Louisa in the form of a long trip. It all starts when President James Madison sends John Quincy to Ghent, Belgium in 1814 to work out the details of the War of 1812 Peace Treaty. John Quincy sends for Louisa and son Charles. He asks her to travel from St. Petersburg, Russia to join him in Paris, France. That's some 1,800 miles. That's as far as from Indianapolis, Indiana to Las Vegas, Nevada. She courageously sets out for Paris in the middle of winter with her eight-year-old son and three servants, in a carriage, no less. The trip is a fiasco. The carriage sinks in the snow. Louisa fears the servants might try to rob her. She carries cash in the form of gold. The servants desert her. She hires new ones. Border officials are rude. She stands up to them. Her health suffers, but she perseveres. The incredibly dangerous trip lasts more than 40 days. Louisa and son Charles arrive in Paris. John Quincy greets them without fanfare or special commendations. So typical of him. Louisa's maid requires two months of bed rest. Louisa doesn't miss a beat. She resumes her normal duties. So typical of her. It is now 1817. John Quincy and Louisa are finished in Europe. They return to Washington, D.C. John Quincy serves as Secretary of State under President James Monroe. 
a position often seen as a stepping stone to the presidency in those years. But it's plain for everybody to see. John Quincy is a klutz in social situations. However, Louisa charms just about everybody. She's a lovely ornament in social settings. In 1820, Louisa starts hosting Tuesday night sociables in their home. Sociables are very large parties hosted for hundreds of people, men and women. Louisa often provides the entertainment by playing the harp and the piano. Louisa's sociables are the talk of the town. Louisa determines to use her social graces to benefit her husband, and he couldn't be happier. In truth, John Quincy has his ambitions fixed on the highest office in the land. Louisa is not far behind. The Jackson Ball of January 8, 1824, is Louisa's most famous effort as political hostess. General Andrew Jackson, John Quincy's likely presidential contender, is front and center at the ball, arm in arm with Louisa throughout the evening. And he hopes that Andrew Jackson will waltz out of the presidential election or dashed. He tosses his hat into the ring, but John Quincy wins the 1824 election against Andrew Jackson. He could not have done it without Louisa. Louisa's hospitality in the White House is warm and sincere, gracious living, choice foods, and fine wines. For Louisa Adams, there's no holding back during this one and done presidential term of her husband. Forced to live in the shadows of her formidable mother-in-law, Abigail Adams, and White House hostess icon, Dolly Madison, Louisa Catherine Johnson Adams emerges as a woman of courage, grace, and charm. Louisa's husband, John Quincy Adams, or JQA, as he refers to himself, is seeking a second term in office. His wife, Louisa Adams, his best asset, is by his side. Once again, the opponent is Andrew Jackson, the incredibly popular war hero. Unfortunately for JQA, his first term as president has been a total disaster. He has few followers and even fewer friends. John Quincy Adams loses the election. He isn't gracious in defeat. He refuses to attend Andrew Jackson's inauguration in March of 1829. But keep this in mind. When John Quincy's father lost his bid for re-election, he refused to attend Thomas Jefferson's inauguration. Like father, like son. As for Louisa, she remains dignified in defeat. But she doesn't get to pass the torch of first ladyship to her successor. Rachel Jackson dies of a heart attack just a few months before her husband's inauguration. John Quincy and Louisa Adams return to New England, even though the prospect of practicing law is dismal indeed. Louisa is certain that parlor politics won't control her life anymore not. Two years later, the good people of Boston elect JQA to the House of Representatives, and Louisa becomes the wife of a congressman. These are happy years for Louisa, better late than never. It turns out that JQA is better suited for the legislative branch of government than the executive branch. He champions the right to petition a forerunner to the violent anti-slavery sentiments which are waiting in the wings to engulf the country. In 1848, Louisa's husband dies in the Speaker's room of the House of Representatives. Louisa's pedigree prepares her for a life of public service, but we can't help but wonder 
Does politics ever truly seize Luisa's heart and mind? In the early years, Luisa learns to silence her opinions. But isn't it interesting? Luisa is among the first women to attend congressional debates. In later years, Luisa corresponds personally with anti-slavery proponents. She's amazed. They seek her opinion on important national issues. Luisa Adams lives to see the 1830s and 40s usher in a new era of presidential style. The aristocrats give way to the populists. Perhaps Louisa Catherine Adams, the brave first lady, the dignified and cultured woman who braved an 1800 mile carriage ride, paves the way for the common folk. Louisa Catherine Adams dies at age 77. Congress respectfully adjourns for her funeral. Sarah Childress Polk was not an aristocrat. She was not foreign born. Sarah was a frontier girl who most likely never crossed an ocean and perhaps never even saw one. Sarah, devout and devoted, would, however, enter and leave the White House only to see the size of the country reach from the Atlantic Ocean to the Pacific Ocean. The frontier girl from the backwoods of Tennessee was on the move. Her own words tell us so. I was born on the Tennessee frontier near Murfreesboro on September 4, 1803. Decidedly different from Louisa Adams's London, England birthplace, my father was a successful businessman and planter. I grew up with every advantage that wealth and refinement could afford a frontier girl. It was a rough and tumble life during those years on the Tennessee frontier, which was the opposite of Louisa Adams' continental upbringing and lifestyle. Indeed, we were born and raised worlds apart. I attended several frontier schools in Tennessee where I learned the social graces of the time. Since the frontier offered few educational opportunities for girls, it was decided I would attend the Moravian Female Academy in Salem, North Carolina. This was in 1817. I was only 14 years of age. At the academy, the curriculum was comprehensive. Arithmetic, grammar, Bible study, Greek and Roman literature, geography, music, drawing, and sewing. It was bittersweet when my time at the academy was cut short by my father's unexpected death. My family needed me back home in Tennessee. But my life adventures were really just beginning. I met James Knox Polk. I would come to learn he seldom used his full middle name, but rather just the initial K. Once we were married, I only signed my name as Mrs. James K. Polk. On legal documents, I would use Sarah C. Polk, but I digress. James was nearly 24 the fall of 1819, and I was only 16. James was serving as clerk of the Tennessee Senate, and I had just returned from Salem, North Carolina. I must admit, I was no particular beauty, but I did have a pleasing countenance and a formal education. These qualities were attractive to James. Some historians have speculated I might not have given James a second glance had he merely remained clerk of the Tennessee Senate without aspirations for more prestigious positions. I certainly don't recall doing anything that would give rise to such sentiments. It's hard to imagine that anybody would suppose to know the heart of a teenage girl. James was elected to the U.S. House of Representatives from Tennessee in 1825. John Quincy Adams had just been inaugurated as the sixth president of the United States of America. 
I still remember our first separation as husband and wife, as if it were just yesterday. James went to Washington, D.C., and I remained in Tennessee. After a year apart, James insisted I return with him to Washington. We lived in a boarding house where I had no cares or concerns of household chores, nor did we have children, so I was available to move easily to Washington compared with other political wives. During this time period, I was afforded many opportunities to interact and engage with my husband's male colleagues. These interactions piqued my interest in politics. Life in Washington, D.C. was stimulating for me. Since we had no children, I was able to devote myself entirely to my husband and his pursuits throughout those years. There was talk I was too actively involved. Regardless, I advised James, influenced what he read, and helped write his speeches. James sought and valued my partnership. These 14 congressional years shaped and prepared me for many duties yet to come. I'll be honest, I shared fully and completely in my husband's ambitions to gain prominence and stature in his political endeavors. I didn't make the man, but I did fully partner with him. We were completely devoted to one another. James was Speaker of the U.S. House of Representatives from 1835 to 1839. He played a key role in the original gag rule which barred discussion of anti-slavery petitions. This is not surprising given the fact my husband was a slaveholder. John Quincy Adams, now an ex-president turned U.S. congressman from Massachusetts, was on the opposite side of this issue, fighting with his every breath for the right to petition. The temperature was rising regarding the slavery issue. Then came the presidential election of 1844. James Knox Polk won the 1844 election. He was considered by many as the dark horse candidate. I adamantly disagree. He was an experienced politician with a prominent place on the national stage. I entered the White House on March 4, 1845 as the wife of the newly inaugurated 11th President of the United States of America. The interesting thing is this. My husband came into the presidency with a one-and-done mindset. He made it clear that he desired only one term. Perhaps he thought to himself, if it can't be done in four years, what makes me think it will get done in eight? Or perhaps he knew his own limitations, especially physical. James was seldom in robust health. He was a workaholic, very hands-on. Whatever his reasons, he kept his word and declined to be a candidate for re-election in 1848, the first president to ever do so. I supported his decision. I served as his personal secretary during our four years in the White House. I endeavored to fulfill my responsibilities as First Lady. Because I held strict Presbyterian religious beliefs, and I make no apologies for this, I frowned on dancing, drinking, card playing, and any activity held on Sundays other than going to church. I did so for reasons beyond my religious devoutness. I felt it was important to maintain the dignity of the Presidency and the House. I set a new tone for White House entertainment, more serious and more formal. I was frugal and guarded the purse strings. Some said I was downright stingy. A First Lady can't allow every wind of gossip and criticism to get her down. Washington society wasn't always pleased with my style. However, the country as a whole seemed accepting of my fiscal practices. My chief goal was to be a capable First Lady. By that, I mean that in my one-and-done term, I sought to understand the active work of being First Lady, as well as the social importance. 
I was more interested in politics than homemaking and handicrafts as pursued by most women of my day. I do remember remarking that if I ever found myself in the White House, I would neither keep house nor make butter. Some 150 years later, another First Lady hopeful would say, Look, I'm not some Tammy Wynette standing by my man baking cookies here. I was serious about being First Lady. Along with President Polk, we gave our utmost energy and attention to every aspect of his administration. I started several White House traditions. I hosted the first annual Thanksgiving dinner at the White House. I opened receptions to common people. I introduced Hail to the Chief. This happened on my first night as mistress of the White House. I ordered the Marine Corps Band to play this old Scottish anthem to clear the way for President Polk's arrival because the crowd was getting out of control. It was turning into a stampede. I believe this anthem is still played. People recognize the tune and they know what it means. This tradition has endured. At the end of my husband's four years, he was totally exhausted on all levels. One term had indeed been enough. We retired to Nashville, Tennessee. My beloved James lived only 103 days after his presidency, the shortest presidential retirement in history. Cholera was most likely the cause of his death, as it was for so many others in those years. As for myself, I was a widow for 42 years, the longest widowhood of any First Lady. I seldom left my house, only to go to church. I wore black, day in and day out, year after year. During the Civil War, Union and Confederate generals both called on me. I remained neutral during the horrors of that great conflict. James and I both died in Nashville, Tennessee. We are buried at the state capitol grounds. Sadly, Polk Place, my shrine to James, no longer exists. Then again, the things of this life never do. May James and Sarah Polk rest in peace. But peace was not to come, at least not for the nation. 1850 arrives. President Zachary Taylor threatens to veto the Compromise of 1850, even if it means civil war. He dies suddenly the same year. Millard Fillmore becomes the 13th president. Nicknamed His Accidency, he signs the Compromise of 1850. And so, the third lesser-known First Lady, Abigail Powers Fillmore, enters the White House, all in the course of one year, 1850. A letter written by her daughter Mary tells Abigail's life story. East Aurora, New York, January 12th, 1854. Dear Madam, thank you for your kind letter of inquiry regarding my now deceased mother, Abigail Powers Fillmore. Although it is still most painful to accept her untimely death, I am comforted by the legacy she has left to me, her only daughter. I am forever grateful to her for more than I can rightly account for in this long overdue reply to you. Nevertheless, I shall attempt to convey my mother to you in the most sincerest of terms and accurate recollections. Abigail Powers was born on March 13, 1798 in Stillwater, New York the last of the first ladies to be born in the 1700s. She was educated by my widowed maternal grandmother with the help of my late grandfather's extensive home library. Books and reading became her passion. 
mother had a keen curiosity and love of learning that lasted her entire life. As an adult, she taught herself to speak and read French and played the piano. By the age of 16, mother was teaching school in upstate New York, obliged to help support her family. My father, Millard Fillmore, was one of her pupils. He was a few years younger and a poor frontier farm boy. Following a seven-year engagement, my parents were married in 1826. Mother was almost 28 years old, a spinster, some may say. Father was completing law school. She supplemented their income by continuing to teach, which was not the practice of the time. History has noted that Abigail Powers Fillmore was the first president's wife to remain employed outside the home following marriage. Father entered politics. In 1832, he was elected to the U.S. House of Representatives from New York. Mother remained in New York with my older brother and me. Father lived in Washington, D.C., doing the business of the country in Congress. By 1836, Mother was able to leave my brother and me to join him. It was during my father's four terms in Congress that Mother applied her strong intellect to politics. She became my father's chief advisor and political ally. Remarkably well informed was how one Washington newspaper man described her. My father's respect for her opinions was most strong. Abigail Fillmore had a thorough understanding of pending legislation and current affairs. She took pleasure in discussing such matters. She took every opportunity to enjoy life during these years. My parents left Washington, D.C. in 1842, followed by my father's unsuccessful bid for governor of New York. It was at this time my mother broke her ankle. It failed to heal correctly. I believe the break was not properly set. Some historians claim her health declined rapidly and she became an invalid. It is true the break did not heal as hoped but she was most assuredly not infirm of mind or purpose. A broken ankle did not equal a broken spirit for my mother. In 1848, Millard Fillmore was nominated as Zachary Taylor's running mate for political and geographic balance. The two men never met until after the election. Father had little in common with the old rough and ready and next to no role in President Taylor's administration. During the campaign, my mother was confined to her bed with severe back and hip pain. Millard Fillmore, now Vice President of the United States of America, was left in Washington, D.C. Once again, my mother remained in New York. President Taylor died suddenly in 1850. Father became the 13th President of the United States of America. Mother was now the First Lady. Despite Abigail Fillmore's ailments, she assumed the role of First Lady with calm determination she kept up with a demanding schedule of hosting receptions, dinners, and welcoming guests. Although she delegated many of these duties to me, she did not abandon such social functions or retreat from them to the extent that some have reported. Due to technological advances, Abigail Powers Fillmore received greater press than her predecessors, even Sarah Polk, for the first time in the country's history, the general public was able to see what the First Lady actually looked like in person. A full-length photograph of Mother was mass-produced on small, hard cards known as carte de vistes, which were ever so popular. Thousands of copies were sold to people from all walks of life within society. As I close this letter, and it has been much longer in length than anticipated or customary, 
please accept my most earnest appreciation for your genuine interest in my mother and her place in First Lady history. Although my father only held the office for slightly less than three years, he was not renominated by the party for president in 1852. My mother accomplished and experienced much in her one and done term. Mother exerted significant political influence. She was instrumental in convincing the president to ban flogging in the United States Navy. Mother was opposed to slavery, although I do not believe she was an avowed abolitionist. She tried to persuade the president to veto the Fugitive Slave Act, part of the Compromise of 1850. President Fillmore did not heed my mother's advice and signed the law. The fires fueling the slavery issue were continuing to be stoked. As First Lady, Abigail Powers Fillmore was the first to wear clothing created with the aid of a sewing machine, the first to work in a profession outside the home after marriage, the first to be the school teacher of a president, the first to be received as a bona fide public figure, the first to have her first name used in the press, the first to be a partner in public appearances and official ceremonies with the president, on one occasion the only woman in attendance, the first to be daguerreotyped or photographed, the first to create a White House library which reflected her love of books and learning, the first to host in the White House library musical gatherings, robust political discussions, and notables such as Charles Dickens, Washington Irving, and Jenny Lind. On March 30, 1853, less than one month after father ended his term of office, my mother died of a chill contracted at the inauguration of Franklin Pierce. The New York Times described my mother as a lady of great strength of mind, dignified manners, genteel decorum, and much energy of character. Both Congress and the President Pierce's cabinet adjourned in mourning. I shall not be amazed if history records her as one of the most influential first ladies in our country's history. Yours truly, Mary Abigail Powers Fillmore. Mary Abigail Powers Fillmore died on July 26, 1854 in East Aurora, New York, just one day after contracting cholera. She was only 22 years of age. Think again of the years 1825 to 1853, a brief period in our country's history, the time period for today's program. Eight presidents in 30 years and only one, Andrew Jackson, actually held the office for two terms. John Quincy Adams and Louisa Catherine Adams, seemingly ill-suited for one another, yet both ambitious for the presidency of the young republic. Louisa Catherine Adams, our first and only foreign-born First Lady. How would that work today? Could history repeat itself? Louisa Catherine Adams, a politician's wife her entire life, yet only four years in the White House. Does she remind you of any other First Lady? James Knox Polk and Sarah Childress Polk, the expansionist president, Sarah always at his side, the first lady from the West, the Tennessee frontier, noble, true, sincere, influential. Sarah, the first lady who knew from the beginning it would only be for four years. What if it had been for eight years? Sarah asked the band to play Hail to the Chief to clear the way for President Polk's entrance. 
The tune had been used before Sarah's time, but Sarah would repeatedly request the old Scottish anthem throughout her husband's term. Millard Fillmore, unremarkable by most accounts, stuck with being the unlucky 13th president, strikes it rich when he meets and marries intelligent and mature Abigail Powers. Abigail Powers Fillmore, remarkable once she is given her due, seemingly more first than all her predecessors combined. Super smart and willing to use her intelligence. How have we missed her all these years? Abigail Powers Fillmore, the first first lady to have her first name used in the press. We take it for granted today. Abigail Powers Fillmore, the first first lady to be photographed. No more hiding behind a commissioned portrait. And so we start to think that lesser known does not mean less important. Louisa Catherine Adams, cultured and dignified. Sarah Childress Polk, devout and devoted. Abigail Powers Fillmore, intelligent and mature. Commendable traits for a first lady. Are they relevant yet today and into the future? In closing, a second release is in the works, focusing on three different lesser known first ladies, each married to a one-term president husband. Perhaps Lucy Hayes, Helen Taft, Florence Harding. Thank you again for joining me today.